You know that feeling you get when you find a really great deal on something? It's like, wow, today's my day. Well, you can get that great deal feeling over and over again at the Safeway Stock Up Sale. Enjoy aisle after aisle of big savings on everything you need. Use your club card and get fresh USDA Choice Beef Boneless Chuck Roast for only $3.99 a pound. Selected varieties of General Mills cereals are just $1.49 each. And find coupons throughout the store for amazing deals on Stock Up favorites. You're going to love the Safeway Stock Up Sale. It's just better. Log Talk Radio. You're listening to Holistic Living, brought to you by East West Healing and Performance. And now, here are your hosts, Josh and Jeannie Rubin. All right, everyone, welcome to today's show with Ray T. PhD. And we'll get Emma on here in just a little bit. I want to thank everyone once again to tune in to our show every month. Uh, last show's uh, last month's show with Lita Lee was great. So if you uh, don't didn't have a chance to listen to that, go to our Blog Talk Radio show and check that out. Most of the links that I talk about, you can actually go to our website at eastwesthealing.com, and in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a little YouTube, Facebook, Blog Talk Radio show, all those things. You can click on them and directly go to those pages. So don't forget to check those out because we have a lot of free information there for everyone. Of course, I want to talk a little bit about our business before I introduce Ray. Uh, Check our website at eastwesthealing.com if you want to learn more about what we do. We actually work with clients all over the globe, so feel free to give us a call and fill out that form. As well, if you want to check out our website, you'll see there's an on-demand tab. You can click on the on-demand tab and you'll see the Metabolic Blueprint. Check out our Metabolic Blueprint program that we're launching January 5th in regards to nutrition and healing face off a lot of different philosophies from Ray P, protobonds, etc. If you can't find a link, feel free to email us at info at eastwesthealing.com and we'll send you the link so you can check it out, learn more about it, or sign up. Today we're doing a question and answer show with Ray Pete once again. I know a lot of people have been really waiting for the show. If you want to learn more about Ray, um, his website is raypete, R-A-Y-P-E-A-T.com. He's got tons of articles on his site that would probably keep you busy for the next 50 years. He's got books that you can actually um, order. You can send in your money in order form and they'll mail them to you. And he's got a newsletter as well on his site that's, um, I think, well worth the money. It's very inexpensive for the year. And they get mailed directly to your house and they're unbelievable, just packed with information. Ray has his PhD in biology from the University of Oregon with a specialization in physiology. He's taught at many, uh, many schools, including the University of Oregon, Urbana College, Montana State University, National College of Naturopathic Medicine, and a couple of the schools that I can't pronounce, and Blake College. So if you want to see those other schools, you can check out his website at repeat.com. He started his work with progesterone and related hormones in 1968. He did a paper on physiology, chemistry, and physics in 1971 and 2, and his dissertation at the University of Oregon in 1972, outlining his ideas regarding progesterone and the hormones uh, closely related to it as protectors of the body's structure and energy against harmful effects of estrogen, radiation, stress, and lack of oxygen. So if you want to learn more about Ray, check out his website. Like I keep saying, it's just filled with information. You can learn more about him. And like I said, before we get him on, like I've said a million times, I know from doing the show and our Facebook page and everything, a lot of people have been emailing Ray, and he's definitely probably one of the nicest guys, and we'll just keep answering questions. It is the holiday season, and I'm not saying Ray has asked me to say this because this is 100% on me, but I've said this from day one. Whether it's a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever you feel you can send to say thank you for what he's done for answering the emails, that for us would be greatly appreciated because he's donated his time to do this um, and really help us out. So you can just send the money or whatever you want to send to his house. It could be a gift. It could be whatever, just to say thanks for all the help that he's done for us. So let's uh, get Ray on. And I know a lot of people listening in, you're welcome to call in today at 347-426-3546. I have tons of questions here on email from, you know, callers that have questions about Ray's philosophies, etc., But don't be afraid to call in and just realize if you're on hold, be patient, and I'll get to you. Ray, you you on the other line there? Yes. All righty. Is there anything else you want to add before we kind of get going? Uh, No, that covered everything. All right. (laughs) So I got a lot of questions here, and 
Yeah, I don't think we'll have time to answer every single one of them because I have probably 50-plus questions. But um, I have been getting a lot of questions from people regarding um, iron. And a lot of people want just kind of a summary, if you can, on your thoughts about iron, you know, because it's, you believe it's a heavy metal and it's toxic and it has all these effects on the body. So if you could clarify just a little bit for people on your thoughts on the dangers of iron. Um, wherever iron gets loose, um, it is available to react with things like polyunsaturated uh, fats, but also uh, protein and nucleic acids and such. But the reactive form of iron is the reduced ferrous form uh, rather than the fully oxidized ferric. And that means that if you don't get enough oxygen to your tissues, uh, the iron tends to get reduced by glutathione. And uh, that's people talk about oxidative stress, but reductive stress is really uh, what you have to worry about in relation to iron. Uh, alcohol, for example, interferes with uh, the use of oxygen and causes uh, the reduced glutathione to uh, accumulate, uh, to shift the ratio towards reduction, and that activates iron, uh, reduces it to the reactive uh, ferrous form, and then uh, that causes the damage. And um, iron accumulates uh, faster than it should under the influence of estrogen, among other things. But uh, inability to use oxygen properly uh, intensifies the absorption of iron. And uh, that seems to be what estrogen is for, is to... Um, create the illusion of an oxygen deprivation so that you absorb more iron. Uh, a woman, uh, they've tested uh, the absorption of percentage of a dose of iron in women versus men, and women absorbed nine times as much iron as a man did. Uh, that's primarily the influence of estrogen. And the action of estrogen is um, to create the uh, the need for more iron to carry blood, to carry oxygen in the blood. But uh, unfortunately, besides making uh, the body absorb it, it also uh, tends to create the conditions uh, that make iron toxic and uh, puts it into the reduced reactive form. And um, one of the main things that uh, activated iron attacks and, and tends to start chain reactions in uh, is the um, polyunsaturated fatty acid. And that, too, uh, strongly interacts with estrogen. Uh, if you eat polyunsaturated fats to excess, uh, they will activate the estrogen circulating in your blood and they will also turn on the enzymes that produce estrogen. And then estrogen, in turn, activates enzymes that um, desaturate and elongate the existing uh, fatty acids, uh, turning, for example, linoleic acid into arachidonic acid, um, which, it, it again, creates a vicious circle in which the Estrogen increases the most reactive PUFA, which activate and increase the uh, quantity of estrogen. And both of those uh, contribute to the activation and uh, intensification of iron toxicity. Uh, so you can break the cycle in different ways, donating blood to get rid of iron or uh, doing things to interrupt the estrogen fatty acid cycle. Now, so with that same question, the the um, person was asking, if you have, based on your lab, well, first off, what would be a normal uh, lab value 
of iron that you'd want to see. But what if you have low hemoglobin? Is it still safe to actually donate blood, or, or are there alternatives? Would you recommend, like, sipping coffee after a meal or, you know, et cetera? Uh, there's no blood test that I know of that will really uh, say anything meaningful about your status of iron because the iron tends to hide in your liver and bone marrow. And um, the blood tests that that people often go by uh, can go in either direction uh, without any relation to the iron stores. And the fact that when you give someone an iron supplement, it increases their red blood cell count or their hemoglobin doesn't mean they were deficient in iron because they used to treat anemia uh, with doses of arsenic. <laughs> uh, the arsenic creates the stress that tells your body you need more iron and uh, uh, more blood. And, and so any stress that interferes with oxygen use will make you drive up the blood production system. Right. And when you see low hemoglobin, would that be due to estrogen? Um, yeah, all animals that have estrogen, uh, the female tends to look slightly anemic. Right. Because it, uh, it does something to slow the production of red blood cells. Uh, p partly lowering the body temperature is, right. is one of the actions of estrogen and uh, slowing down thyroid function. So uh, probably the most common cause of apparent anemia, as Rhoda Barnes pointed out, is hypothyroidism. And uh, I think he was the one that mentioned the experiment in which uh, rats whose tail bones normally don't make red blood cells, in this experiment, they uh, folded the, the tail back and made a hole in the skin of the abdomen and stitched the tail so it was kept in at core body temperature and it quickly uh, began producing red blood cells, just raising the temperature. And and so uh, the first safest way to treat anemia might be to wear long wool socks huh. to nope. warm, warm the extremities. Right. Now, what is copper's role um, in regards to um, iron? I mean, I know copper is important for iron uptake and utilization. Um, um, its uh, primary role is in the respiratory enzyme okay. cytochrome oxidase. And, right. uh, that, uh, I think, is probably uh, the reason that copper is essential for, for constructing the hemoglobin molecule. Right. So what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, that you feel that most people, because we actually can't get rid of it unless you, you know, profusely bleed, actually have higher amounts of iron in our liver and our bone marrow. We store it, which in a sense is toxic, and of course, along with estrogen, makes it more toxic. So the only you feel that most people are actually in an iron, iron overload state, and they might be showing up low on a lab because they have maybe absorptive issues in their hypothyroid in a sense. Yeah, um, in men, it has a direct tendency to accumulate right. continuously with aging. Uh, menstruation probably uh, helps women avoid the accumulation until they stop menstruating, and then the curve uh, is maybe even steeper than, than men's. It right. uh, builds up by the age of 60 or 70 to pretty much rival uh, men's, but uh, I, I think the menstruation probably is one of the factors that uh, makes women have a, a greater longevity. Right, right. Um, there was a study of um, immigrant uh, fruit pickers' kids in California who um, didn't get a good diet, but they ate lots of oranges, and uh, they had on average, I think, a hemoglobin of of 10 versus the, I think, below 12 is considered uh, tending towards anemia. But they found that these kids didn't get infectious diseases uh, like the well-fed uh, city kids who um, had lots of hemoglobin. And 
Um, they've seen that same thing in Africa that when they uh, would have campaigns to give iron supplements, uh, lots of people would come down with malaria because iron uh, activates the the growth of germs and weakens our immune system. So one of the tests that's meaningful in the blood but that's seldom done is the iron saturation. Mm. Uh, and people tend to be resistant to cancer development if the saturation is is somewhat low, like 25%. Right, right. Good stuff. Now we got a couple of callers. I mean, I have tons of questions. Would you like to just keep going, or do you mind taking sure. a caller? Anytime. Okay. Mr. Chris Dillon from the 908, is that you? That's me. How are you doing, Josh? Dr. Pete? How's it going? Good, brother. How are you doing? Good. All right. Shoot. All right. I have actually two separate questions. Dr. Pete, uh, regarding ADD, ADHD, and as we've been seeing a rise of these diagnoses in the last couple of uh, decades, do you feel that it's really sugar the problem or poly could be more of the polyunsaturated fats? Um, I think it's the unsaturated fats. Um, the um, sugar uh, tends to um, move everything in, in the right direction away from uh, brain malfunction. The, uh, the polyunsaturated fats uh, interfere with the tension uh, and um, increase adrenaline and the sympathetic nervous system and the stress hormones. And uh, I, I think that's probably the main thing, as well as hypothyroidism that, that keeps the front part of the brain uh, from getting enough energy to, to focus. Hmm. Interesting. It's it's funny because you hear people, you know, saying sugar is the problem, and yet, and you hear more people saying, you know, let's take omega three fatty acids to help with brain development, and we yet we're seeing an increase in this ADD, ADHD behavior. So, thank you for answering that. Uh, my second question is regarding Hashimoto disease. Um, can you explain the proper way for it to be diagnosed? Because again, I'm getting a lot of people uh, claiming that doctors saying they ha have Hashimoto, but I realize that sometimes the antithyroid antibodies that are found in the blood really don't have any relation to the thyroid gland. I wonder if that's um, true. Yeah, the, those antibodies interact with um, cartilage of the joints just about as well as with the cartilage. So it's it's really a connective tissue inflammatory disease which goes with hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. uh, the cartilage is is. Um, one of the first places that you see hypothyroidism in children. Uh, it accounts for why hypothyroid kids tend to be a knock-kneed uh, and why, why girls aren't good pitchers often because the cartilage in the knees and the elbows uh, is um, basically swollen. Hmm. So, uh, so basically a lot of people walk around being misdiagnosed for this, right? Um, ways. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much for your time, Doctor B. Josh, I'll give you a call later. Thank you. Thanks. How's it going? All right, All right brother. Good questions. I was actually just gonna, I was reading one of your old articles on Hashimoto's um, and thyroiditis, and I found it pretty interesting because you talk about how estrogen is affecting. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. The colloid and actually stimulated stimulates it, but inhibits the exact proteolytic cells to break it down. And that's why a lot of people are getting diagnosed with Hashimoto's because it's not so much um, the thyroid itself, it's the altered production of the antibodies because of estrogen. Um, yeah, the, the whole idea of autoimmune disease is, uh, I think, uh, off the mark. The, uh, <laughs> uh, the immune system, I think of it as a, a cleanup the mass uh, system. Uh, uh, the antibodies help the phagocytes remove debris, and if the debris is caused by an infection, they'll get the germs too, but if the debris is caused by low thyroid causing the connective tissue to swell, the immune system has to come in and, 
and try to help clean out the junk that builds up because of low thyroid. Right, right. All good stuff. Now we've got another call. Do you want to answer some questions or take another caller? Oh, anything. Okay. Caller from the 678, you're on the air. One more time. Caller from the 678, you're on the air. Hi. You there? Hello. Yeah, we're here. All right. Yeah. First of all, I just want to thank you guys for doing this. It's a great resource. Um, I have two questions. One is practical and simple, and that's simply um, how long would you say it would take someone whose body temperature has historically been in the 97s, low to mid-97s, for that to stabilize if that person doesn't have very much very much stored fat um, and kind of institute some of your recommendations, Ray? Right? I've seen a couple of people do it in three or four days, uh, very skinny little people uh, just uh, who had been on a pure soy tofu diet or something as soon as they started eating eggs and oranges. Uh, they just popped up out of there. Uh, a couple of people who had been diagnosed as having uh, broken pituitary glands with no function at all uh, all of their pituitary hormones would pop back as soon as they started eating rationally. All right. Well, that's encouraging. Um, my second question is more general and comes from having exhausted your articles on the website and, and then figuring I might as well look into some of the people you talk about. And um, I read some of Selye's work, and it seems like uh, he believes in that we have an absolute reserve of energy to deal with stress and um, that kind of any stressful event can kind of deplete this and that people start out with different levels. Um, I was wondering if, if, first of all, if that's correct, and then second of all, what you think of that. Uh, no, I think uh, where where he left it is where the issue of cumulative buildup of iron and PUFA comes in. Um, both the long chain polyunsaturated fats and iron accumulate with aging and uh, and with stress and under the influence of estrogen. And uh, uh, so he just wasn't uh, looking far enough and long enough to see how those factors uh, interacted with stress. Um, the stress, uh, while he was looking at the adrenal glands and first their adaptive phase and then their exhaustion phase. Uh, what happens is uh, during prolonged adaptation, uh, estrogen and other hormones, growth hormone and, and uh, uh, the um, inflammatory mediators accumulate and estrogen buildup uh, from blocking the actions of the thyroid function um, the buildup of estrogen begins to directly drive the adrenal gland. And um, when that reaches a certain point, uh, you can actually uh, get bleeding in the adrenal gland and death of the uh, cortical uh, cells in the adrenal under the influence of just an excess of estrogen. And uh, you get the same sort of uh, uh, overdriving from the direct hormonal action on the adrenal glands from a buildup of iron or serotonin or polyunsaturated fats. Uh, and so uh, the systemic effect of, of stress, I think, is what uh, he neglected to, to think about when he talked about the uh, reserve innate amount of energy that we had. All right. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for calling in. Um, no, I'm not sure. I have actually have a question when you're talking about disease, and I'm not sure if it's too vague or actually too big of a question. In one of your old newsletters from 2006, Autoimmunity, you talked about you were talking about Metchnikoff, and you talked about how you you. I'm not sure if you were talking about you or him argue that inflammation was a patho pathological reaction rather than being a healthy part of a defensive immune system. 
So that's, you said, that's mostly me. Okay. <laughs> so you, you feel that inflammation is actually more of a pathological response where most people say inflammation is actually the body's response to helping us back you know, get for, back to homeostasis. For Metchnikoff, uh, he saw the uh, white blood cells going in and curing the problem, clearing up the mess. Right. But uh, because of of the uh, interpretation, he he was an embryologist who um, saw the development through evolution of the meaning of of the immune system. But after the medical establishment took it over, they uh, created the idea of inflammation being the the curative process, but uh, the the swelling, the redness, uh, the pain uh, that uh, are the medical uh, view of inflammation. These, I think, are pathological. The mm. the immune system should work like uh, in the prenatal state. Uh, this is analogous to what Metchnikoff was looking at in his uh, cylindrates and and developing embryos and so on. In the embryonic and fetal state, injury is corrected without inflammation. It, the, the cells just repair the damage in an efficient way and don't leave a scar. And uh, that, when, when you keep the carbon dioxide and sugar where they should be, you basically uh, get uh, fetal or embryonic healing without a scar and without inflammation. Uh, so uh, I, I see it as as um, inability to deliver what's needed to um, repair the damage right. uh, that we see as redness, pain, and inflammation. That makes sense to me. That's it's a pretty interesting thought there. I like it. <laughs> now I have a lot of questions on weight loss. Now, I know this for every individual is there's just so many variables because we don't know people read your articles and they go crazy with dairy. They think that you know everyone should be pumping sugar in their body. So there's a lot of different variables going in here. But I have a lot of questions about people beginning to follow a lot of your philosophies based off their perception of what they read. And they've noticed that, you know, their energy goes up and so forth, but they actually gain weight. Can you maybe elaborate on maybe some of the scenarios that can actually create this and maybe what they can do to actually halt this? <laughs> uh, well, um, gaining weight probably isn't the issue. It's gaining inches <laughs> and, <laughs> and bulging. Um, it, when you're doing everything just right, uh, very likely you'll rebuild muscles that were damaged by stress and poor nutrition. And as those muscles quickly grow, uh, you should be doing things like uh, feeling your calf muscle, seeing how big it is. Uh, you can even use calipers on the contracted muscle and, and see it grow as you're eating right. But uh, the circumference of your uh, thighs, hips, and belly uh, should be decreasing, even though your weight is increasing. Um, when I experimented first with DHEA, uh, I, I wasn't expecting anything. I was just wondering what it felt like to take a few milligrams of it. And I noticed after a week or two in the mirror that my waist seemed to be reappearing after having been uh, just sort of a straight-sided appearance uh, for previous years. And uh, it made me wonder, uh, my my pants were getting looser, and so I thought I must be losing weight. So I checked, but I was exactly the same weight, uh, having uh, shrunk around the waist. And uh, what happened was that I was simply growing uh, more lean tissue and, and uh, burning up some of the fat, so that uh, I had more muscles, uh, but was smaller around the waist. So initially, a lot of people, well, of course, people have to work on what they're eating, their ratios and calories, but for a lot of people, and we, you know, people hate hearing this, but it's actually a sign that your body, your body's actually moving in the right direction and it's actually healing. Um, 
because you're rebuilding. Um, yeah, but um, if someone is putting down fat rather than muscle, right. their pants are getting too tight, they're just eating too much, probably too much fat or total fat calories. Yeah, and that's a whole other issue in itself. And so. uh, that's, I've, I, I've mentioned that at times I've um, averaged over the years probably a gallon of milk a day, uh, but that's always been 1% milk. Uh, because even at two quarts of milk, a person uh, doesn't want to have whole milk at three or four yeah. percent fat. <laughs> What's interesting is when you say those things, I don't think you realize the repercussions. You you have all these people walking around trying to drink gallons of milk, but they're drinking <laughs> they're drinking whole milk, and I'm like, why am I gaining so much weight? <laughs> but that's that's good stuff. Uh, another question here, and I, I kind of have a feeling what you're going to say, but what are your feelings, or maybe talk about, you know, aromatase inhibitors. What are your feelings of aromatase inhibitors? And, you know, because there's a lot of people out there that say take calcium deglucrate or take DIM or whatever, which we know in a sense is actually cru cru from cruciferous vegetables. So that can actually be more toxic to the liver. And what, uh, yeah, the, the, um, uh, that, um, Basically, they're usually selling just powdered cabbage leaves and, and <laughs> naming it for that. But uh, that has been tested and found uh, somewhat estrogenic in itself. It, right. it changes the metabolism of estrogen, but it has an estrogenic effect directly. And um, the um, saturated fats, what I was just talking about, the estrogen uh, aromatase activating effect of PUFA yeah. that's antagonized when you shift the balance to saturated fats. And uh, aspirin, by blocking the uh, uh, formation of prostaglandins and reducing inflammation, interrupting the effect of the PUFA, aspirin is a very effective aromatase inhibitor. Huh. But the drug companies don't want people to know that because they charge tens of dollars for a pill of their stuff where aspirin costs a penny. <laughs> um, but at the same time, if people just eat a diet that's or low or void of unsaturated fats, a diet of saturated fats, eat the right types of carbohydrates and the right amount of protein in itself, wouldn't that diet through regulating cellular metabolism actually inhibit aromatase enzymes or downregulate estrogen itself? Um, yeah, uh, thyroid uh, inhibits aromatase. Um, anything that lowers cortisol inhibits it because cortisol is a major activator. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people out there taking those supplements and promoting them, and it's pretty interesting because they'd actually be more toxic on the liver. Um, and talking about the liver, going back to the iron thing, so if people start to eat this way and really increase their saturated fats or let's say they're taking a thyroid glandular or whatever, is it dangerous? Because you're kind of indirectly detoxing the liver, correct? Is it dangerous because it's storing so much iron um, that it could actually, you know, the, the new principles, the new diet or whatever actually backfire? Um, and, no, no. The um, iron, if it's in the oxidized state, is just sitting there doing no harm. Okay. Um, it, it forms like little granules and uh, doesn't get out or go anywhere to do anything. Right, right. Good. Now, going back to the iron things, I know you talk about this in regards to iron, but some people want just a you know a summary on coffee because there's so many out, so many people out there, and of course it comes down to how we use it, and when it's being used, what it, what is it being used with. But everyone says, well, coffee causes adrenal fatigue and and so forth. And you have you, which is probably a 180 of everyone out there, saying that coffee has a lot of benefits because it's pro-thyroid, it's pro-progesterone, uh, it helps with iron absorption, et cetera. Can you elaborate a little bit more on, you know, why and maybe how to use it? Um, yeah. Um, do you have any idea of who started the idea of adrenal fatigue? Uh, I've been trying to find out who is responsible for that <laughs> word. I think it was a little boy in a sandbox. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, the um, uh, coffee 
contains um, a lot of good things besides the caffeine. Uh, it's an extremely concentrated source of magnesium right. and a very good source of niacin and some of the other B vitamins. But the, the caffeine has an antioxidant effect. Uh, as long as you uh, use it with food, uh, it tends to uh, stabilize your blood sugar and reduce inflammation. Probably its anti-inflammatory effect is is the most important thing. Now, in regards to how to use it, because there's a lot of people, of course, in America that just chug coffee all day, you know, they go to Starbucks, etc. And, and I, you know, going back to the adrenal fatigue thing, and I'm not saying I'm not here to prove anyone wrong because I'm just some, you know, little guy in California, but I feel that people took Hanselia's work in those that general adaptation syndrome, those three phases, and they ran with it and came up with adrenal fatigue, in my opinion, because the last stage is exhaustion. So yeah, I don't know where it came from. Exhaustion know where it, is where the, the adrenal gland dies. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to get to exhaustion. But, right. Uh, the so. idea of fatigue seems to be something else. And uh, right. if, if you... Uh, have enough cholesterol and are eating a good diet with vitamin A and your thyroid is okay, in proportion to the amount of cholesterol in your blood, you will um, be able to produce pregnenolone and progesterone, which the, the progesterone in itself has all of the functions of the adrenal hormones for aldosterone and and cortisol, for example, uh, so that uh, Hanselli took out animals' adrenal glands. Right. And if if they were pregnant, they didn't have any symptom at all until they gave birth, and then they had the usual uh, shock uh, effects. But um, that led him to give progesterone to animals that had their adrenal glands removed, and they lived fully normal lifespans, not needing their adrenals at all because progesterone alone covers the spectrum. And um, with adequate vitamin A and and thyroid especially, uh, you will convert um, cholesterol into pregnenolone and progesterone. Mm -hmm. And the adrenals uh, are very good at repairing themselves uh, to... In some types of experiments, people wanted to uh, have the adrenal uh, medulla removed but have the adrenal gland be able to produce the steroids. And they would open the capsule and simply scoop out all of the contents and then sew the animal back up. And within a couple of weeks, the adrenal gland had no medulla or or nervous part left, but it was a, a whole adrenal cortex was regenerated just from the the cells of the capsule. Right. So, the heart, you know, like I said before, the repercussions, you know, like aspirin, everyone listening, don't go out and start popping aspirin. Same thing with coffee. It's all about how you use it. Now, you talk about when you use it or how you use it is very important, correct? Because you, and correct me if I'm wrong, sipping it after a meal would be more beneficial um, with some cream and sweetener because uh, it can help with iron absorption after the meal, etc., rather than just drinking it on an empty stomach. Uh, yeah, taking it with or after the meal uh, has um, basically none of the harmful effects. I've known several people who said that just a, a sip of coffee would make them feel shattered and shaky for yeah. the rest of the day. But I told them to put some heavy cream in it and maybe some sugar and take it with each meal, only with each meal. Right. With, within three or four days, these people were happy coffee drinkers. Yeah. <laughs> Most people that drink coffee are <laughs> pretty happy. I actually just got an email from a listener, and I don't know if you've ever heard this, that said, adrenal fatigue, he thinks adrenal fatigue was coined by Dr. Lamb or Dr. Wilson. Um, I don't know that, but 
I don't know if that rings a bell. Um, another question is, what do you think about, there's a lot of people out there utilizing, you know, supplementation, enzymes, et cetera. What are your thoughts on, you know, regulating metabolism, using your nutritional philosophies and utilizing those things? Do you find them to be beneficial or do you feel that it can actually um, cause a more of an increase of endotoxin, et cetera? Um, it depends on uh, where the supplements come from. Okay. Uh, um, people with very sensitive digestive systems have to be very careful of any supplement uh, just because of the, the factory it's made in uh, might, might carelessly introduce things and there might be uh, residue left from the microorganisms that were used in processing it. Uh, so you have to be really cautious about allergies. Right. right. Another big question. There's so many people out there, you know, and keep in mind when I bring up this stuff, and I'm not here to say anyone's wrong and right. I'm just here to bring questions up. But there's people like Dr. McCuller, et cetera, that promoting that fructose is death. That fructose causes diabetes. It causes everything. Um and there's a lot of controversy out there, and there's a lot of people that read your articles and say, "Well, you you kind of promote it in the opposite way." Um, Could you um, give us? Just a few go- days ago, I heard from someone in New Zealand who uh, said he had been uh, diagnosed a few months ago with uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Right. And he said he uh, started. I I didn't get the details of the d- whole diet, but it included 300 grams of fructose every day. And uh, he now has uh, a new diagnosis. His liver has no fat problem. Huh. So everyone else is saying that fructose by itself causes fatty liver, causes high triglycerides, causes diabetes. Do you feel that they're missing, you know, they're missing the boat because it's the unsaturated fats with the fr- um, yeah yeah it's my article newsletter on uh the sugar questions uh, two months ago uh goes through the history of right. how the, how that fructose phobia evolved over the last fifty or sixty years right. and it, it's very closely connected to the cholesterol doctrine of heart disease and and the idea of essential fatty acids being essential yeah. And and if essential, then beneficial, and if beneficial, not toxic. Huh. And uh, meanwhile, the actual science was going on uh, for uh, basically 80 years, showing that the uh, essential so-called fatty acids are toxic and carcinogenic. Okay. Uh, just straight-line research that was uh, submerged by the the um, oil industry uh, perverting the medical establishment around the the cholesterol doctrine of heart disease. And Ray brought up his newsletter, guys. Like I said, if you want to get it, it's it's really cheap, and I'm not here to sell them, but it's a, they're just unbelievable pack of information. And you can go to his website and his store, and for 12 issues of 28 bucks, 38 dollars out of the country, 48 dollars elsewhere, it's actually you know, it's it's well worth the money. Uh, so take take a look at it. Um, some other questions for callers. This is kind of an interesting question. I'll kind of read it to you. Um, it says, you mentioned that pigs are fed on soybeans or other sources of poof as their fat tends to become more unsaturated and therefore unhealthy. And Barry Groves says the same thing. However, if their fat was truly unsaturated, how come it's still solid at room temperature? Uh, which fat is that? The unsaturated. Um, I don't know which one would be solid at room temperature. What kind is that? I think they're talking about, I think they're saying, you know, you feed a pig poof as a soy, that unsaturated fat technically is is uh, um, liquid at room temperature. And they're saying, well, if you take out a piece of bacon, they're associating the fat, it's actually solid, it's not liquid. So. Oh, well, it isn't. <laughs> if you extract the, the fat... Uh, when when I was a kid, uh, I would get uh, blocks of lard for my grandmother, 
and they were definitely solid at room temperature, just like butter. But uh, the lard that I've seen in recent years, which is um, now slightly over 30% PUFA, uh, it's soft at room temperature. And uh, the, the fat droplets in bacon naturally are enclosed in, in cells and connected by connective tissue. Uh, so even if it was 100% PUFA, it would still have a, a white, uh, firm appearance. Right, right. Now, I, I know you've answered this question before on other shows, but it's on here, and I think a lot of people still have this, this question because it comes up a lot. There's so many people out there on, like, a Cytomel or et cetera, T3 medication, and there's a lot of people being sold that time release is actually better for them. They want to know your opinion on time released versus just your basic cytomel. Is there a difference, and is one better than the other? I've um, heard from several people uh, who were having either uh, overdose effects from the time release or no effects, and uh, I got some uh, documents from a lawyer who was uh, defending. Uh, someone and so they had the uh, compounded time release T3 analyzed uh, by a couple different laboratories and no T3 could be found in it. Uh, the T3, if you compound it uh, carelessly, it's very easily uh, destroyed or lost or oxidized or otherwise decomposed. And and with the wrong uh, time release agent that might work for for vitamin A or something, uh, it might uh, just permanently bind the T3, or it might release it as soon as it hits your stomach acid. There just hasn't been uh, good research on how to compound a time release T3, and even uh, a lot of the generic products uh, that. Uh, they presumably have imitated Cytomel. Uh, some of the generic products uh, have very erratic effects. Um, uh, generally, I, I don't uh, think the idea of a, a patented brand name medicine is a good idea. It's usually mostly fakery. But um, in the case of T3, I haven't uh, seen a good other product. It's pretty interesting. There's a lot of people out there that get sold that the time release is, is the only way to go. So, I mean, it's just good to know you get options and what's going to be best for that person. But nutrition first, if possible. Another question about the carrot seems to always come up, and I think, um, you know, it's a simplistic medicinal food that gets really put into a complex People just are confused on, you talked about how to use it, you know, shredding and et cetera. People, which I find kind of odd because all you have to do is eat one carrot, they're finding it hard to carve out time to eat a carrot alone. Do you recommend eating it before a meal, with a meal, after a meal? Is there any difference or is it really that simple, just eat a carrot a day? Usually it's just eating the carrot, but if you're having a problem with low blood sugar or, or thyroid irregular uh, function. Uh, if you eat it with a meal, you might slow digestion to the point uh, that uh, you aren't getting your food as expected, and and so you might feel shaky after eating because you're not absorbing uh, your food or activating your thyroid properly. Um, but if a person wants to uh, reduce their fat absorption, eating the carrot with the meal uh, will accelerate weight loss. But oh boy. <laughs> um, you have to fit it in the, the way that functions best. And uh, uh, one, one thing to keep in mind is that if your intestine has been sluggish for a long time and you start stimulating it uh, with the raw carrot, uh, you will be changing the rhythm of the peristalsis and uh, it takes sometimes a week to set up a new rhythm around a daily carrot uh, so you can get some side effects while you're adapting 
uh, creating a new bowel rhythm. Right. And you find sometimes that it can actually constipate people? Oh, very rarely. One okay. in a thousand or so will uh, react to the carotene. Um, if you're very low thyroid, if the palms of your hands and calluses are orange, then you might want to rinse the carrot after grating it to get some of the carotene out. Right. Yeah, it's good stuff that works, and now everyone's going to start eating it with their meal because you said it aids in weight loss. <laughs> everyone's going to be going crazy now eating carrots during their meal. It's great. <laughs> so talking about carbon dioxide, this is huge, and I know a lot of times you're talking about it at the cell level. And a lot of people out there, you know, eating your philosophy, the whole goal is to increase carbon dioxide production by the cell. A lot of people want to know, Beside the nutrition, if they're trying to increase their carbon dioxide levels, um, you know, would adding baking soda to, say, orange juice throughout the day, would that actually help? And is that something you recommend? Um, well, some orange juice is so sour that people tolerate it better if they put a pinch of baking soda in it. Uh, the orange juice companies typically add citric acid if they accidentally get ripe oranges because people are so accustomed to the acidic uh, tang of the orange juice. But um, the, um, you tend, if, if you um, put it in acid, baking soda is going to uh, bubble off most of the carbon dioxide. Uh, right. Some will, will dissolve in the water, um, and it, it might increase your systemic CO2 a little bit. There have been experiments where, like with uh, bicycle racers in Death Valley, they had them take a tablespoon of baking soda before the race, and they found that uh, they performed better because of the either the increased sodium or the increased CO2. Now, what do you think? When you say that anything you do nutritionally to to um, downregulate serotonin would actually upregulate CO two as well, is that correct? Um, I'm not sure how okay. general it is. Probably okay. it seems probable. Okay. Um, guys, don't forget to call in if you want to call in. I'm mean, gonna have a ton of questions, but you're welcome to call in three four seven four two six three five four six. Next question is about coconut oil. Um, if someone doesn't have a gallbladder, is that the best source of fat since most of the uh, medium chain fatty acids don't need bile to digest? Um, and are, are there any other good sources? Oh, I think um, just um, eating things in a mixed form in small amounts is important if you don't have a gallbladder. Uh, the bile is still going to be there, but it's coming out in dribbles rather than surges. So mixing your fats with your proteins, carbs, in smaller amounts? Yeah. Okay. It's pretty simple. Um, in regards to a poof, like detoxing from poof, is I think in one of your books or articles you talked about, I think it takes like four years or something like that. Um, um yeah, that's uh, some experiments in right. both rats and people. Uh, they found that it depends on the size of the fat cell, depending on right. uh, that rather than the size of the organism. And it, it's just a slow process to uh, randomly renew the uh, composition of the fat cells. Right, so this person wants to know because of you know starting to eat based on some of your philosophies, um, they feel that maybe because of the poof of detox, they're actually having initially uh, more kind of react reactive hypoglycemic reactions, and they feel like they might be getting worse. And is that because of the poof of detox, and is there any way to make it easier? Um, keeping your blood sugar steady and uh, even adding some saturated fat, uh, the saturated fats inhibit the uh, stress hormones, which um, means that they also tend to inhibit release of fat from stores. Uh, so sugar and saturated fats and niacin and aspirin and uh, various uh, safe nutrients inhibit the release of fat. Uh, so 
doing everything you can to keep the fat in place, it isn't going to uh, completely uh, stop the uh, reduction of the fat. The fat cells themselves are able to slowly oxidize. I think uh, um, someone calculated that a person could, um, just in their fat cells alone, if the fat never leaves, uh, the fat cells will consume about three pounds in a couple of years. A very slow reduction, but the uh, minimal release uh, into the bloodstream isn't going to cause the stress symptoms if you're having the saturated fats to turn off the stress reactions, uh, outweighing the pro-stress effects of the the liberated fats. Right. So what about using like maybe foods or, or, or topical or powder supplements like vitamin E or niacinamide? Um, yeah, niacinamide is uh, uh, an anti-fat liberating substance. Right. And uh, usually 100 milligrams twice a day is all it takes, but it's um, fairly safe to use larger doses if, if it's needed. Yeah, yeah. Now, everyone listening, don't go out there and start popping niacinamide to something that maybe some people might need. So don't start going crazy and buying it. Um, I get, the, the, one of the ways that the body safely eliminates um, the um, uh, stored PUFA is through the liver. The liver uh, r- recognizes whatever is carried on the albumin as it streams through the liver and the albumin binds uh, anything that's that's uh, fat soluble and carries it to the the liver. And the liver, when the albumin uh, arrives carrying either um, a, a dioxin or or uh, one of one of the um, toxic environmental uh, estrogenic substances, um, the liver will capture it and bind it as it uh, processes it for detox, and uh, it recognizes the PUFA as toxins and will selectively uh, attach glucuronic acid to them just as if it was dioxin and and send it to the kidneys for excretion. Uh, And that's the safe way to get rid of it, let your liver take care of it. Hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. Got a caller in the Buzz this caller in. Caller from the 386, you're on the okay. air. Caller from the 386, you're on the air. And we're going to take them off because we can hear ourselves in the background. <laughs> Guys, when you call in, make sure you're kind of in a quiet spot. If you want to ask your question, and I can kind of... Um, hang up on you and let Ray answer it, that's fine as well. Um, Question about blood pressure. Um, Can high blood pressure be looked at similar to like high cholesterol, meaning the more stress, so it's an adaptation mechanism? Um, Yeah, it, um, when your body senses um, that it's um, not getting enough oxygen or uh, glucose or other essential factor, it tells the heart to um, pump more blood to deliver more oxygen and, and glucose. Uh, and uh, that's that's the way it should work. But uh, uh, when you're loaded with PUFA, uh, they're tending to give chronic signals to the brain that nothing is getting uh, the glucose and oxygen that it needs because, in truth, the PUFA are interfering with the use of of glucose and oxygen, but the PUFA are also telling the the pituitary and the nervous system to uh, crank up the stress signals. Mm -hmm. While we're on the topic of blood pressure, there's a couple questions about salt. Um, And I think one of the great articles slash newsletter newsletter you wrote, if people haven't read it, is about eclampsia. In the real organism, it's it's one of my favorites. And if you haven't studied the work of Tom Brewer, guys, I got kind of his name from 
Dr. AP. He's got some great books on uh, pregnancy, eclampsia, toxemia, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about just the benefits of salt? And so, you know, why is it so important not only for us but also pregnant women? Um, the um, eclampsia problem is um, very closely connected to uh, high PUFA, and that goes with low thyroid, and low thyroid goes with the uh, low carbon dioxide and poor ability to retain sodium. And right. so the sodium is constantly being lost, as well as the the magnesium. And uh, as the sodium is lost, the um, adrenals try to correct things by increasing aldosterone, uh, which does retain sodium, but it, uh, it at the expense of losing magnesium faster. And if your thyroid is low, you not only lose sodium through the kidneys, but your cells can't retain magnesium. And and so, uh, on a, a low sodium intake relative to your your hormonal needs, uh, what you're doing is turning on a system that makes the problem worse by letting out uh, the magnesium that is needed for for cell energy and uh, controlling inflammation and and tension and cramps and and so on. Uh, so if you just increase your sodium intake, you're compensating for uh, a low thyroid function, but you're turning off the aldosterone and getting the aldosterone down directly lowers inflammation and stops some of the magnesium loss. So just by adding uh, sodium as as Brewer and the people he based his thinking on, uh, they showed that just sodium alone would very commonly uh, cure the whole problem. And uh, that that seems to be acting by way largely of the uh, aldosterone system. Now, what does it have to do with albumin? Does albumin play into that in in um, regards to regulating, you know, water distribution and, and how albumin is actually affected by estrogen? Um, yeah, estrogen interferes with the liver's uh, synthesis of albumin. Right. And um, the polyunsaturated fats uh, under stress are going to be circulating in the blood and the, the albumin is picking them up, but if you're producing less albumin and having more unsaturated fats, uh, the albumin isn't able to detoxify them very well, but it, it becomes saturated with unsaturated fats. And when, right. when albumin is loaded with fats, it goes right into cells. Uh, that's part of its function is to deliver saturated fats to um, stress tissues. Uh, so that's part of, if your fat is saturated, the albumin has a logical function uh, to uh, increase the energy supply during a crisis by taking it right into the heart, for example. Right. And uh, saving sugar for the brain to use and so on. Uh, but in the kidneys, <laughs> this being overloaded with uh, fat happens to make the uh, albumin pass right through the kidneys into the urine. Mm -hmm. And and so you tend to uh, lose albumin under, as well as sodium under the influence of, of high uh, stress and, and PUFA. And um, it shows up as albumin in the urine when you're under uh, great stress. And the um, albumin, to one of its functions is to retain water in, in association with the um, open uh, protein molecule. It uh, has sites that associate with sodium, and the sodium associated with water is kept in the vicinity of the albumin molecule. But if you're low in sodium, the albumin can't work. 
and if your albumin is low besides, uh, then you get a double problem of water retention. Um, so the the, um, the first thing that happens when you when you correct your your fats and thyroid and estrogen and so on is that you let water out of your body while retaining the sodium, magnesium, albumin, and all the stuff you need. Right. And that's why when women are pregnant, their blood volume goes up so much. Um, it's because of albumin. And, and Tom Brewer talks about estrogen lowering that and affecting blood volume and high blood pressure. So yeah, I guess I, the fetus and the brain are being deprived of right. estrogen and sugar. Yeah. And, and so you get the signals to drive up the blood pressure, but the, the same thing is causing the blood volume to go down. So you've got to get the blood volume up and, and salts the the quickest way to do that. Right. We've talked about salts before, so that's great. We have a caller, a couple callers, actually. I'm going to take the caller from the 415. Caller from the 415, yeah, you're on the air. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering what you think of um, heavy metal detox as far as if you get your amalgams, multiple of them, out of your mouth and the doctor or dentist wants to put you on uh, like IV glutathione or vitamin C drips or major doses of cilantro or chlorella. Do you think that's all necessary, or can you get the um, mercury out of your tissues, which seems to uh, be a uh, year as people think it's saturated their tissues? Um, do you Hunt, think you can get out on your own, or you need supplements? Hans Selye did experiments with uh, poisoning animals with mercury uh-huh. and uh, showed that a given dose would, would cause death of, of the kidneys and such, but then he gave them the same amount of mercury plus vitamin C, and they had no toxic effects at all. The the mercury in its reduced form isn't toxic, it's just a metal. But it, it's like iron, it depends on the exact state of reduction that makes it stick to things. And uh, caffeine is um, associated with uh, getting the heavy metals out of your tissues, uh, probably as a sort of chelator, uh, but uh, vitamin C from regular foods is an important defense against uh, all of the heavy metals. But if you take these reducing agents in an unphysiological way, they can activate iron. Like I mentioned in the liver, alcohol causes um, the reduction of iron by activating glutathione. Glutathione is the agent of making iron toxic. And so you, if you put glutathione or another reducing agent into the blood in an uh, unphysiological way, it can increase the free radical damage. Oh, great. Okay. So don't sit there with a drip in your arm. You don't need it. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks for calling in. Sure. We got another call I'm gonna take him. He's been on hold for about ten minutes. <laughs> Caller from three eight six, you're on the air. Um, yes, this is Debbie and I am calling uh from the Bray Pete fans on Facebook with a very basic question that's been on a running thread of ours for the last couple of days. And that hey, is Hi. Um, uh, we want to know if there's a reason or an advantage to shredding the carrot. Oh, uh, there have been experiments with the length of the fiber. And, uh, uh, for example, uh, they experimented with um, different ways of milling bran. And uh, the one that was called B-wing bran had about ten times better function in the intestine than the ordinary way of grinding it to a dust. And it's the same if you put a carrot in in a blender, uh, you're destroying a lot of the water-retaining uh, function of the fibers. Well, what about uh, as opposed to eating the carrot whole? Uh, yeah, your teeth uh, leave large sections of the uh, fiber intact. So we should shred the carrot. 
or or chew it. Uh, just chewing it is very good. Okay. That is uh, that is what we needed to know. Thank you so much. And it's a real privilege to be listening to you today, Dr. Pete. Thank you so much. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Good questions. Um I got some a tons of questions and this is kind of a general question and if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. A lot of people want to know if you're familiar with Weston A. Price's work. And they want to of course. And they want to know your thoughts on it. Oh, um, he um, saw that um, traditional diets uh, produced um, good tooth development, generally, and uh, uh, bone development. So uh, his work was uh, basically very good, seeing that uh, you can eat a lot of traditional diets um, and and be healthy. Okay, that was simple. Another question is regard to fertility, but not female fertility. We're going to go talk about the men. Um, if someone has, let's say, low sperm count or quality, could you talk about maybe some reasons for that? And what could they actually maybe change in their diet to actually help increase that or alleviate it? Uh, low thyroid is probably the main cause of both male and female infertility. And uh, already in the 1940s, people saw that pregnenolone alone by itself was enough to um, greatly increase sperm quality. And uh, the um, polyunsaturated fats, which interfere with uh, the steroid production as well as thyroid uh, function, uh, are a major villain in uh, male fertility. Interesting. So just really following consistently a lot of your diet recommendations, food, eliminating kufas over time will help to increase sperm count and just male fertility, just like women. Yeah, I've seen several people uh, in just, uh, I think, two or three weeks uh, using pregnenolone and thyroid. Uh, the, just uh, the, the man doing that, uh, the couple got pregnant the very next month. Okay. Now, this question is from Karen MCC. She wants to know about sleep. There's a lot of people out there that are following your principles and they feel good, but one of the things that is troubling them is sleep. They maybe fall asleep and wake up, or they have trouble sleep, or they wake up and their pulse is super high. Can you maybe elaborate on why and give us maybe some basic things that people would do to help alleviate that? Um, Yeah, uh, taking too much thyroid too soon. can do that. Your liver should store enough glucose or glycogen to uh, let you fast for at least eight hours, uh, in the, especially in during sleep. Uh, but before the liver has regenerated its ability to store glycogen, uh, the the thyroid is making your brain and uh, muscles and kidneys. Uh, need more sugar and oxygen and so you have to eat more more often until your <clears throat> liver is able to uh, adapt now let's say someone's eating the principles and not taking a glandular and they consistently have high pulses now what now we could say it's adrenaline we could say they're hypothyroid do you feel that if any if they were to change anything in their diet it would be the amount of carbs they're taking, they would have to increase their carbs to regulate their blood sugar more, or would they eat more often? Increase um, the- yeah, eating more often and uh, making sure that the the fat is um, just enough to keep you from absorbing your your sugar all at once and burning it. Uh, having some fat with your your carbohydrate makes it absorb more slowly. And- so incre- increasing the fat intake. Uh, yeah, sometimes that that helps to sleep through the night to have a, a good amount of fat along with your carbohydrate at bedtime. And salt. Um, I've known uh, very young and very old people both with sleep problems who, uh, as soon as they tried a very salty snack at bedtime, uh, just had 
perfect sleep. Um, salt, right. salt is um, very effective at lowering adrenaline. Hmm. Good stuff. We got another caller. I'm going to take this caller. Caller from the 718, you're on the air. Uh, yes, hello. 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 You're on the air. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, I'll try to make it uh, as brief as possible. Um, I, uh, for, for about a year, uh, I was uh, somebody who was, like, at least I perceived it as being very sugar intolerant, and every time I tried uh, taking it, uh, it would just, um, I, you know, even a very small amount, uh, I just felt terrible from it. And uh, about maybe two weeks ago, I tried, uh, I was able to get pure fructose. And after about two or three days of taking fairly large quantities of fructose, um, I really felt great. And I noticed I had a tolerance uh, where I could actually consume all types of sugar. And um, um, and uh, I was able to, uh, you know, have anything from soda to orange juice or whatever. And it, I, I felt I was starting to feel really good after about a week from it. And the problem is, is recently, maybe about, uh, two or three days ago, uh, I started having uh, pretty bad sleep problems as a result of. Well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but it feels, it felt, you know, sort of similar um, to when I eat MSG and uh, I have like a pain in the lower part of my rib cage. And so, just the last maybe day, I was able to. I switched over to starch, uh, which is similar to like what I was on beforehand, uh, and uh, it was. Uh, you know, like I, my sleep kind of normalized. Uh, um, what kind of fat were you having with it? Uh, primarily uh, coconut oil and, and butter. Not not much else other than that. Um, have you had any uh, digestive problems noticeable? Well, actually, I noticed when I was on the sugar, it was actually quite a bit. Uh, I mean, it was much better. Uh, I mean, very, very noticeably better. Um, and in this, it, with the starch, it's sort of like um, uh, it's not so good. But uh, the, the, I've maybe been on it for maybe like a day or two, and the sleep sort of normalized very quickly. And I'm just wondering, um, maybe it's like some sort of detox, or I don't know. I think it's probably that the starch is is um, getting. Uh, digested and assimilated more slowly, and that eating some fiber with your carbohydrate, uh, fiber and fat will extend the absorption of it longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the um, normal thing is that the sugar is absorbed quickly in the upper part of the intestine, and starch, if it's slow to break down, can feed bacteria lower in the intestine and and cause uh, intestinal inflammation that interrupts sleep. But, oh, okay. Um, uh, I mean, I, I have very uh, high RT3. Does that would that have anything to do with it? Yeah, that's from high stress. Um, oh, okay. Uh, and getting your endotoxin and and cortisol down. Uh, I've seen quite a few people just with. A, a daily carrot uh, get their their intestine disinfected enough uh, that their reverse T3 goes down and and their cortisol goes down and uh, so the combination of fat and fiber might be a way to, to make your blood sugar steadier. Oh, okay, well I'll, I'll definitely try that. But the fructose is really unbelievable. That's good to hear. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for calling in. <clears throat> Good questions, guys. If you still have more, you can call in 347-426-3546. Got another question here on dental health. Um, question about, there's a lot of people who recommend eliminating sucrose, fructose, and most fruits um, when people have dental ailments. And on the other side of it, you know, you, you talk about increasing you know, carbohydrates, you know, for, for cell metabolism, et cetera. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, why there's so much maybe conflicting information on that, and what contributes to, to dental issues? I saw a recent article on uh, dental 
health in Sweden, and uh, they saw that during the time that cavities have decreased radically, uh, sugar, candy, and and uh, soft drink consumption had actually increased, and they couldn't account for for why the teeth were healthier while they were the basic diet hadn't changed so much, but had increased in the supposedly uh, cavity-causing f- snack foods. And the, the um, in my sugar article, I mention some of the old studies um, in which they uh, m- modified the uh, thyroid or estrogen and found that uh, increased estrogen increased the dental decay, uh, increased thyroid, reduced the dental decay. And one whole line of of, uh, dental research has um, shown that stress will very quickly cause an outbreak of cavities. And uh, mainline dentistry uh, just thinks in terms of of germ growth in the mouth and uh, completely neglects the uh, chemical and immunological uh, function of the saliva. Uh, it's, it's, um, I think the saliva is the mediator of stress. Hmm. Interesting. Now, kind of going on to a different topic, this question I think is in regard to, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, I'm not too familiar with it, the work of Dr. Ron Mignery, Ph.D., and they want to know that, you know, he talks about fasting in, uh, for at least periods of protein restriction to upregulate the process of, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, autophagy or auto, I don't know, oh. or the self-eating of old and damaged proteins, which is supposed to help starve off diseases, including cancer. What's your thoughts on that? Um, well, activating your metabolism, running things faster, is going to uh, eat up proteins that shouldn't be there. Uh, and uh, one of the main things interfering with the breakdown of protein is the uh, PUFA, especially the long-chain PUFA that accumulate with aging. Uh, and uh, uh, the people uh, like to talk about the the membranes as where the the uh, fatty acids are are active and where they make a difference, but uh, the, the um, experimental background of uh, what the membranes consist of is just completely ignored uh, by by mainstream medicine. Uh, the uh, like cholesterol itself is um, part of our cell division apparatus, part of the chromosomes, uh, uh, part of many functional proteins. Uh, So are the free fatty acids and the phospholipids that they participate in. Uh, The the, uh, the nuclear structure and and the uh, cell division structure uh, is regulated or uh, deranged by the type of uh, fatty acids in your diet, uh, and uh, accumulating uh, the long chain uh, fatty unsaturated fatty acids with aging is um, changing the way the cell functions at the deepest levels. Hmm. Now, kind of on that same note, you have people like um, I've never heard of Cynthia Kenyon's work. And Rob Wolf, all these people that promote carb restriction for longevity. What's your thoughts on that? Um, the, um, in the in the short range, uh, just fasting itself will reduce the endotoxin absorption, and so uh, that's always uh, an effect that can help things like arthritis and so on, and the. Um, uh, dropping your uh, carbohydrate intake will raise your cortisol production, uh, and people feel better very often from either fasting or just dropping the carbohydrate intake because the the 
cortisol excess produces a, a sort of anesthetic euphoria. Um, people can get addicted to, to taking uh, cortisol pills because it makes them feel good, makes the pain go away. But in the long run, uh, that's stressful to turn protein into the carbohydrate that your your brain and blood cells need. Um, uh, it, it requires a shift towards a higher cortisol function to break down the proteins. And, and so what you're doing is running on stress so that the proteins that you eat will be converted to um, the sugar that you need. Hmm. And if you have the carbohydrate in your diet, your cortisol is going to run lower, uh, like like the uh, the monkeys they've studied. Uh, right. When when fruits are are scarce, they uh, have very high levels of of cortisol. Yeah, yeah. I remember one of your articles. I posted something the other day about that. It's pretty interesting stuff. Now, kind of going on a different topic. Someone wants to know about your thoughts on cell phones, and are they really unhealthy, or do you feel like it's hype just like microwave threats? Well, microwaves are a threat, and so they uh, fixed the oven so that they weren't irradiating people so much. Uh, <laughs> the ovens uh, used to not have good seals on the doors and, and used to actually uh, emit very intense fields. And the telephones, the same way, uh, there have been uh, experiments for over 50 years showing that there are real biological effects from uh, even moderately weak uh, fields. But uh, here it's the uh, the doctrine of the cell membrane again. Uh, the, the the standard medical doctrine is that a cell has a, a fat membrane around it because it needs something to seal in a watery solution of chemicals to to isolate it from the environment because you have high potassium and, and magnesium in the cell, low calcium uh, um, and sodium. And to maintain that balance, they visualize uh, needing this barrier membrane. And uh, so they see a random solution of chemicals in in water as being what life of the cell is. And therefore, uh, for a radiation to um, affect the chemistry of the cell, it has to be just like uh, the effect of, of the same radiation on those chemicals in a test tube. And they show that you have to basically have enough microwave energy to cook an egg or something before you see damage to the chemistry of the uh, those enzymes and such in a test tube. But in the cell, the whole problem is that there is no such barrier membrane. Uh, it's the, the whole structure of the cell which does the regulation, uh, not a, a magical barrier at the surface that, that keeps a random... Um, solution inside. The whole cell is so highly organized that it um, many of the regions have an antenna-like function that respond to very low levels of electromagnetic energy. And if you actually do the experiments, you can see that uh, an animal's behavior, uh, chromosome function, <coughs> reproduction, and so on, will change at at very low levels that aren't heating the, uh, the the enzymes, aren't heating the organism noticeably. But it, it's this uh, very persistent doctrine in medicine that, uh, that the inside of a cell is a random solution. That's the basis for saying that microwaves are harmless. Right, right. Now going back to the thyroid, someone has a question about, you know, you say thyroid a lot and they want to know what you mean. I think I, I assume you're always talking about T3. And at the same time, there's a lot of people out there trying to buy glandulars because they can't take T3 or they can't, can't get T3. Um, so the first question is, 
do you recommend if people need it for people to take thyroid glands or lose? And my question is as well, I've read somewhere, I don't remember, that if people are really, and if their adrenals are really super stressed and there is something going on with them, that if you do take something for the thyroid, that you can actually get worse because you don't have the energy reserves to actually handle the increase in metabolism. If a person's cholesterol is down around 100 milligrams percent, uh, then they have to be careful with everything. They're very fragile. Uh, the cholesterol is a basic anti-stress substance. And you've right. got to get the cholesterol up to um, at least normal, minimum 160 milligrams percent, preferably somewhat higher, uh, before you uh, worry about increasing your, your uh, general metabolic rate and energy production. Uh, and orange juice is usually the, the safest first way to get your cholesterol up to normal. Right. And then if your cholesterol is up and you're getting enough of the vitamins and minerals that are essential, uh, then the thyroid will very quickly uh, make your adrenal glands adapt. And with the balanced uh, thyroid hormones that were in the traditional uh, thyroid glands that people got in fish head soup uh, or uh, chicken stew where the neck included the thyroid gland, uh, those traditional diets, the, the thyroid consisted of about uh, three parts of T3, of T4 to one part of T3. And as the liver uh, gets energy in the form of, of glucose, it will convert T4 to T3 to um, adjust the amount of, of uh, T3 and energy production. Um, if you don't have uh, sugar and take your glandular, uh, you just experience uh, about 25% of, of the potential effect of it, your liver is not going to activate the rest of the T4. So uh, the, the the glandular is in a way uh, safer because it lets your liver handle your physiology to a great extent. Um, if you try to take just T3 and completely satisfy all your thyroid needs with pure T3, your uh, TSH goes down, your thyroid uh, stops working momentarily, uh, but if you don't take your T3 during the night, uh, your TSH is going to rev up and uh, turn on a lot of inflammatory processes, and uh, you'll experience acute hypothyroidism in just 8 to 12 hours of not taking your T3. Uh, so it's most convenient for most people to have some of the T4, as in the, the glandulars. The trouble is uh, the, the um, technology of making a glandular product seems to have been lost. Uh, Armour was making their traditional thyroid product for, for about 85 or 90 years and uh, Revlon, the cosmetics company, bought the product and uh, went through several changes of ownership. And in the process, uh, the new owner decided to extract uh, thyrocalcitonin to have a new product. And so they, they kept selling the remains of the thyroid gland minus, minus the uh, calcitonin and... Uh, subject to whatever process was needed to separate it. So the new uh, thyroid glandular, uh, e even in the so-called traditional armor, is no longer what it used to be. Hmm. And there has been research to um, catch up with uh, the, the, um, the new product. So if you think about the research that was done with armor for all of the 20th century, you can't necessarily say that it's going to apply to whatever is is being made with the so-called armor uh, 
equivalent or generic material if if the, the manufacturer is selling part of it separately uh, it isn't really the, the traditional product hmm. that's good stuff right there can you talk a little bit more or just talk a little bit about the correlation and the roles between magnesium and calcium and one of the questions was about you know your they feel your diet recommendations are high in calcium what's the optimal ratio and where would you get magnesium um, well, coffee is a, a great source of magnesium, but um, you get if, if you're not under stress and your thyroid is good, you your cells have a tremendous ability to retain magnesium because it binds to the ATP molecule, it becomes part of the molecule, and if your thyroid is low and you don't produce ATP fast enough, the cell doesn't have the main thing that binds magnesium intracellularly, and so it it tends to go out into the bloodstream and get lost in the urine. Um, so your thyroid status is the main thing that determines how much magnesium you need. A low sodium intake will make you lose magnesium by increasing the aldosterone production. And... Um, so you can't talk about the ideal ratio of of the minerals uh, in abstract because uh, it, it's the interaction, um, and the same with calcium. Um, calcium lowers a lot of the excitatory, inflammatory things, which would tend to make you lose magnesium and sodium. And so, if you have a diet that seems to be deficient in one of these, you can very often solve the problem with any of the other four, uh, potassium, sodium, magnesium, and calcium. Uh, uh, William Frederick Koch, uh, who um, was one of the first people to study the parathyroid gland, would remove the gland and uh, cause the the muscle contractions from the uh, absence of the uh, parathyroid hormone but he found that he could uh, cure the spasms with any of the minerals, not just calcium, but uh, potassium, sodium, or magnesium would also cure the spasms. So it, it's a, a matter of having a total of these alkaline minerals, uh, not right. an exact balance. And one thing that is... Uh, uh, an Another factor that interferes is the phosphorus or phosphate intake. Right. Uh, a lot of Americans get seven times as much phosphate as calcium, and it, it takes many years uh, for the effects to show up. But uh, the uh, one of the functions of fructose is to make you lose phosphate uh, faster than otherwise, uh, and that's supporting the function of the parathyroid gland to improve the ratio between calcium and phosphorus. And uh, if, if your fructose intake is high, then you don't have to worry too much about the, the exact ratio of calcium to phosphorus. But the ratio in, in milk, uh, 1.3 to 1, is very close to a, a very safe ratio. Uh, but you can easily get get by with uh, two or three times as much phosphate as calcium, uh, especially if your sugar intake is good, and and then if if you're um, getting plenty of of salt and calcium, you don't have to worry much about the uh, the other two alkaline minerals. Doesn't calcium and phosphorus they have an inverse relationship in the body? So if one's high, one's technically lower a lot of the yeah, time? Yeah. Well, and then a lot of people that do, because a lot of people will take magnesium or a CalMag supplement because they have restless leg syndrome, you know, restless leg syndrome, et cetera. So a lot of the times, if they're deficient in calcium, the cells have taken up calcium. By taking calcium alone, you can actually decrease that excitatory nature and upregulate magnesium in itself without any taking it. Is that true, too? Um, yeah. Um, that's why... Um, Potassium and, and sodium and calcium will often 
prevent cramps or or spasms and such. Uh, they're helping you retain your magnesium more efficiently. Right. Just a couple more questions, and you know we, we can wrap it up. If anyone has any calls, feel free to call in three four seven or any questions three four seven four two six three five four six. Anything you want to add in, Ray? Nope. Okay. I had a kind of off-the-wall question. I didn't even know you were working on this, and I don't know if you even know you're working in this, but a uh, caller or, you know, follower had a question about if you were working on or almost finished with your book on the thyroid. And no, not working <laughs> on it right now. Okay. That's a bummer. <laughs> um, another kind of off-the-wall question, one of the listeners wanted to know if all the emails that you get um, – from from followers, if you feel uh, supported or if they are becoming a nuisance. Oh, um, there are some people who ask very trivial questions that they should just think about or or look up from for themselves. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. It's a good point. You know, and like I've said before, guys. You know, if you're emailing them, you know. You need to kind of compensate him for his time, and at the same time, he's got tons of articles on his site. You know, take the time to read them. Um, it's that's an important aspect of it. Um, so, if you guys want to call in, I'm, I'm pretty much out of questions. I mean, I rattled through probably fifty, sixty questions. Um, there were some general ones, but like I said, I felt like people. I didn't ask them because I feel like people could just read some of your articles, and I don't think they're questions you need to answer. Um, so before we kind of wrap up, guys, if you have any questions, three four seven four two six three five four six. Ray doesn't really have anything else to add. He mentioned um, I'm pretty much out of questions from people. Um, so before we hang up, if you got any questions, feel free to call in. We got about you know 15 minutes left. It's been a pretty long show, and in my opinion, it's been an awesome show. Um, so, does anyone have any other questions? Feel free to call in. You can email me as well. I'm getting a lot of emails and, and Facebook from people in regards to uh, their questions. Let me just take one more check to see if uh, any are popping up. Um, no, that's about it. I think that's, uh, oh, that's all the... I, I might comment about... Um, I was talking about the uh, changes in the manufacture of, of uh, thyroid glandulars. Yeah. Uh, vitamin E is another thing that has undergone radical changes. Uh, uh, when ADM uh, bought the, the old Eastman distillation products uh, factory for making vitamin E, uh, they uh, changed the methods and the consistency and appearance of vitamin E changed a lot and then the, the FDA told them they had to start acknowledging that they were diluting it with with soy oil and such but uh, uh the um still the the product that's commonly in use uh <coughs> looks very different from from the old material um when i was working at the university lab uh the freezer had some uh, old vitamin e from sigma that uh, they had used in research in the 50s and I tested some of that with experiments I was doing on liver extracts and uh, got reactions that were extremely interesting that I've subsequently tried with the newer vitamin E's that I get no reaction at all. So uh, there were chemical functions present that are interfered with by, by something that's appearing in the vitamin E. And the research uh, up until uh, about uh, 1990, from uh, the 1920s on, was just unanimously uh, about its beneficial effects, uh, except for the, the periodic uh, attacks in Journal of the American Medical Association. But then in the last 10 or 15 years, there have been more publications about uh, ineffectiveness of vitamin E or possible adverse effects. And uh, I've been thinking about what some of the changes from the 
original 1930s and 40s product might have been. And uh, the saturated long chain alcohols, uh, octocosanol and polycosanol, uh, were always associated with the original uh, ways they made vitamin E uh, that increased the viscosity. Uh, vitamin or uh, uh, wheat germ oil was a common starting material, and that was rich in these uh, very long chain, completely saturated alcohols, which immediately metabolize into uh, long chain saturated fatty acids. And uh, if you look up the research on octocosanol and polycosanol, you see that there was a lot of uh, endurance uh, uh, effect improved endurance from uh, the use of small amounts of these. And uh, I suspect that uh, the the original vitamin E research, uh, which showed that it protected against the polyunsaturated fatty acids and their toxic effects, I think a large part of that might have been from adding the completely uh, saturated long fatty acids along with the vitamin E, sort of neutralizing the PUFA, uh, similar to Hans Selye's uh, research in which he showed that uh, canola uh, uh, would um, cause death of heart cells. But if he added uh, chocolate fat, cocoa butter, to the same amount of of canola, uh, the heart had no injury at all. So the, the saturated fats have a defensive antitoxic effect uh, that I suspect were part of vitamin E's original action. Good stuff. We've got another caller. We'll take this one last caller from the area code 253. You're on the air. Hi, this is Justin from uh, Washington. I was oh, reading Justin one of uh, I was reading one of Ray's uh, older books. And he, I saw something in there about uh, very interesting on the correlation between how uh, Mexican children didn't get polio and uh, its correlation to uh, the milling of wheat and such things. I was wondering if he had any comments on other vaccinations, how he felt about that, or uh, uh, like anything to do with the infectious disease model. Oh, um, yeah, I suspect that the the same thing that the the Mexican immigrants in California, uh, the kids were immune to a lot of the childhood infectious diseases uh, uh, just because of their relative iron deficiency. I I think that's uh, probably a big factor in the traditional Mexican diet. And the uh, traditional tortillas, interestingly, uh, are very high in calcium because uh, they they boil it in uh, lime, uh, and uh, it leaves a, a large amount of calcium. Uh, my dentist in in Mexico tells me that uh, her uh, clients with uh, some tooth problem might come in when they're 80 or 90 years old and want want a painful tooth extracted. She said sometimes it takes her all afternoon to get a tooth out of one of these old people. And she thinks it's the high calcium intake uh, for their uh, their lifetime diet of tortillas. And uh, that that has a, an undoubted uh, anti-stress effect along with the, the low iron intake on average. Wow, great stuff. I just want to thank you, Ray, for doing real science and... Uh, like Josh said, everyone else that's listening, I'm going to throw together a little Christmas card and send it out with 20 bucks or something. hope we can all pull together and support some real science because I know there's a lot of people out there that really appreciate you, Ray. So I just wanted oh, to about, thank you. About vaccination, I wanted to mention Ivan <laughs> Illich's books, Medical Nemesis, for example. Uh, he does some good stuff on the history of, of vaccination. Cool. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Have a good Thanks, night. Thanks, Justin from Washington. All right. Bye. Bye. 
we got one last question, and I'll read it to you because it just got emailed to me. What do you feel about all the research regarding cell membrane and membrane signaling in the biotech field? Do you feel like it's a waste of time? Um, well, it's very good business because they can sell anything if they say it's uh, working on signals right. via the cell membrane. But uh, basically, if a cell is stressed, uh, it it will admit things that it wouldn't otherwise and lose things that it shouldn't lose. If if a fat is attached to a substance, it'll get into the cell where it wouldn't otherwise. But when they talk about surface receptors, uh, very often if they actually experiment, they're, it can be demonstrated that the substance is acting inside the cell, uh, not just to the surface. Uh, this goes back uh, 80 years, probably. Uh, well, 150 years if you if you look at the the whole history. But uh, people have been in the 30s were showing that um, that their experiments showed clear uh, entrance of large molecules right into the cell in large quantities. Albumin. Uh, was repeatedly seen to massively enter cells of all different types and um, carry with it whatever it carried. Uh, but uh, immunoglobulin, uh, uh, of several iron transporting proteins, uh, a whole range of our normal proteins just zip in and out of cells freely. Uh, so the, the membrane uh, is not very relevant to actual cell physiology. And if you want to look at at some of the mainstream research, um, Fritjof Sjostrand, S-J-O-S-T-R-A-N-D, who was a professor at uh, University of um, California, Los Angeles, for many years, founded Journal of Ultrastructure Research um, and was the chief editor for about, I guess, 30 or 40 years, uh, his work uh, pretty much all by itself made uh, the, the conventional ideas about uh, plasma membranes on the outside of the cell, um, uh, mitochondrial membranes, mitochondrial function. Uh, his, his work is just completely incompatible with the doctrine that is so popular. Well, that's uh, interesting stuff. Definitely not something I'm too up on, but it's good stuff for everyone to listen to. So I don't have any more questions. I know people are sending me questions. I only have so much time, guys, and some of the questions I don't feel appropriate. At the same time, some of your questions he's definitely answered in past shows, and I'm not going to sit here and unfortunately ask him the same questions over and over again. It's just not something I feel comfortable doing. So um, I thank you, Ray, for this great show and this year. I know everyone like we keep saying, really listens to your shows. Thousands of people, they um, really appreciate your work. I know you probably hear it a lot, but we just want to say thank you because it's been a, it's been a great year, and um, you taking the time to share all this info has helped a lot of people. Okay, and thank you for sharing it. Thank you, Ray. Have a good day. Okay, bye. Bye. So there you go, guys. Dr. Ray Pete once again most humble man I've ever talked to in my life. It's a great show. Listen to it again and again. Listen to all the other shows. I know you have a lot of questions. A lot of your questions were asked in a lot of the old shows. Definitely tune in for more shows in the new year. I'm going to set them up with Ray. And like I've said, I know tons of people are emailing him. Make sure you have to understand that, of course, he's a technical guy. So if you're sending him questions that are very basic, I know a lot of the times, like he said, you know, you can get a lot of this information from his articles. But if you are consistently emailing him, make sure, like I said, whether it's a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever it is, it adds up. Send him a card, send him five bucks, ten bucks, you know, a hundred bucks if you want to to say thanks. You know, thanks for all the email questions, Merry Christmas or whatever you want to send. Um and that's something that, that I think is very appropriate for, for what's been going on. So I thank all our listeners for tuning in to all the shows. Of course, I couldn't do the show without you guys. 
<clears throat> so I really appreciate everyone tuning in. Stay tuned to our Facebook pages, Josh Rubin, Jeannie Rubin, or East West Healing and Performance for um, great updates as well as for some of the new shows starting in 2012. Wishing everyone a happy holiday season and new year, and I'm out of here.